morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to part three or four on the national building regulations. Um, we've been working our way through all these different um, sections of the building regulations. So we're heading towards the, the last couple, uh, getting to the most important one. So last time we finished up with the roofing section. So we'll start off with the part M. L was the roofs. Part M is stairways. There's not a lot in there for us other than trying to avoid them and not break through them or demolish them as we go along. So let me just get my point out here. There we go. So there's a minimum head height or clear space so we don't fit any geezers or we don't fit anything on a stairwell that could actually be in the way of a fire escape or block a fire escape. There's a number of little details around the steps and the size and the, the actual pitch line. Um, not too much to do with us as plumbers. And in part N is glazing. Glazing, you can imagine, um, you've been on most building sites, glazing done by a specialist or done by a specialist to a specific spec that was uh, part of the building plan and the design. There's not too much in it for the plumber other than the only portion, if we are going to be supplying and fitting a bath uh, enclosure and a shower cubicle, if it's glazed, then or any glazing immediately above or within 1800 from horizontal or vertical from a bath or shower will be safety glass for obvious reasons. You can't have people slipping on normal plate glass. So that's the only reference to plumbing as far as glazing is concerned. Then we get to part O. Um, part O would be uh, ventilation. Um, the venting we're doing or the venting that we're involved with will be covered elsewhere. So basically it just says that you can't have um, any obstacles or you shouldn't allow any foul air to enter any ventilated area. So for the sake of putting a uh, uh, vent on bend or a vent valve under a window, that would be or that would fall under this category. So then we get to part Q. Part Q is a is a very funny um, portion of the building regulations. Um, it exists because of the infrastructure in our country. It's called non-waterborne means of sanitary disposal. So the regulation Q3 um, shall be deemed to satisfied where the non-waterborne sanitary disposal has a closet in accordance with 4.2. Um, 4.2 you'll see it just now, and it complies with 4.3.4.4. It's the subject of a rational design. Normally you'll find those would be like a VIP toilet or some formal structure that was erected in accordance with Part P and 10.252 Part 2. An agreement system would be one which is basically a uh, plug and play or uh, a complete unit that just needs to get built in and connected up. And it comprises pale toilets which are emptied by or on behalf of local authority. I think we can all agree that um, at this stage, uh, non-waterborne is, is like a last resort. It is something that um, we wouldn't want to see as plumbers. It's something we should be avoiding. Um, you'll see the note down the bottom. The South African government is committed to the eradication of pale toilets. It's an ongoing struggle. It is in uh, wherever an informal uh, settlement appears, that's the first and basic rudimentary source of sanitation is pails. Um, so it, it's an ongoing thing. It's a it's a it's a work, uh, a, a continuous work in trying to get these things sorted out. So there's a typical example of what would be a VIP toilet and the requirements around the venting. So you'll see basically we've got a structure and we've got a roof. So within that structure, there's venting required for the actual unit or for the actual enclosure. But there's also venting required for the actual hole in the ground, uh, for lack of a better term. That is basically it. We've got a hole in the ground and we have got access to that hole. Uh, 
So this thing could be a honeysucker. You could, this thing could be vacuum tanked out, could be cleaned up. The problem with this is that it is still a non-waterborne. So you end up with either having to clean it out or having to send vacuum tankers or other mechanical means um, of uh, cleaning. The only difference between this and a normal uh, pale toilet is that this one, once it's been excavated, it's a more permanent structure. So the vacuum tanking or cleaning will be taking around this area. It's not like digging in a, a new hole every other six months. So as far as part Q is concerned, waterborne sewage, non-waterborne, sorry, where waterborne sewage disposal is not available, other means of disposal shall be permitted by the local authority provided. It stores, conveys, processes and disposes of human body waste and wastewater in such a way that the pathogens, pollutants and contaminants associated therewith do not compromise the health and safety of the original user or others. And in the case of a chemical toilet or toilet, a satisfactory means is available for the removal and disposal of sewage from those closets. I think uh, just a quick reference, I think I've mentioned it before. Uh, when the World Plumbing Conference was here in 2016, the opening speaker made a statement and the, it went along the lines of that every second of every minute of every hour of every day, somewhere in the world, a child dies of a waterborne disease, be it lack of clean drinking water, be it lack of uh, adequate sewage disposal. It is a definite issue. So, um, take note when it says the health of the original user, in other words, the person using that non-waterborne um, source or that non-waterborne point, um, as well as others. So there's no sense in keeping your end clean, but you're killing the neighbor next door. Q2 says no person shall construct any pit toilet without the permission of the local authority. So the, the, the reason... I suppose, other than getting the actual approval from the um, local authority, that these approvals are, they go hand in hand with uh, Department Water Affairs. You get uh, the Water Services Act. There's a number of other factors involved here, including um, pit toilets within 50 meters from a borehole or within um, uh, a thousand meters off the high water mark. A any any possibility of polluting groundwater, uh, be it drinking water or be it groundwater that ends up on the coastline or on the riverbeds or, or any source of pollution to any other water than the actual toilet that is being used. So these means of sewage disposal shall be so constructed, cited and provided that access to health and convenience of person using these means shall not be affected. The number of receptacles shall be adequate for the population of the building served by that receptacle. So in other words, you can't have 50 people using one toilet. You'll fill that hole up in no time and it'll become a problem. It sounds funny or it sounds um, needless to say, but it actually happens. So the requirements of subregulation one, shall be deemed to satisfy where the design and construction, siting and access to these other means of disposal complies with Part Q, provided that we are local authorities of the opinion that the nature of the means of sanitary disposal is such that it's essential for that installation to be the subject of an approved rational design prepared by a competent person, that local authority shall in writing notify the owner of that building that it's for its reasons and it may require an owner to submit approval uh, sorry, for approval plans uh, of a complete installation. So the requirements contained in two and or in subregulation two shall be deemed to satisfy with the number of receptacles is in accordance with the provision of F11 and P2, which we'll have a look at later. So you can see it's a it's a it's a, a nasty subject, but it is something that is actually um, necessary given the lack of infrastructure, given the vast uh, expanses of our country, we do not have waterborne sewers all over the place. But that does not disqualify that user or that person from having an operational um, sewage system. Let me get to part S, 
part S is around facilities for persons with disabilities. Um, this is something uh, I recall Richard had done a, a, a tech talk around the same subject. So we're just going to flick through this here. Persons with disabilities. Remember, we do not have disabled people. Disabled is when you have a TV and the thing doesn't work and you disable it and you put it on a scrap heap or you put it in your garage. People with disabilities could range from sheer just being old age or being short sighted, um, partially sighted, deaf. Anyone with a disability does not qualify them as disabled. So the layout of a typical facility, we would have dealt with that. Important to note that when we look at these details here, the, the standard allows you 10 millimeters of um, play or 10 millimeters of grace when it comes to the actual dimensions. You'll notice just in short, a uh, paraplegic toilet is higher than a normal toilet so that the person can move from the wheelchair onto the toilet without either dropping down or having to climb up onto the toilet. So a paraplegic toilet, a toilet is higher than a normal toilet. You'll find that the center line of that toilet is prescribed so that that person getting onto the toilet can actually access or use, make use of those grab bars. If this thing is too far off the wall, you wouldn't be able to use those bars or to have those grab rails assist them in getting up and down there. Uh, most of those cubicles, or the, sorry, the requirement for the cubicle is that they have an outward opening door for the simple reason that if something had to happen, you wouldn't be able to open that door inwards firstly. Secondly, you wouldn't want that person leaning out of their chair to get a hold of the door and pull it towards himself. You'll see at these the bottom of these doors, they all have strike plates or they have like a stainless steel plate. So that person can simply run their, or oh, sorry, ride their wheelchair into the door and push it open that way without having to get out of his own way or her own way. You'd be able to exit this room here. Then the last one I'd like to mention, which is considered very important with the um, was it Association for Physically, for People with Physical Disabilities, APPD, is this 250 here. 250 from the rim of the toilet to the edge of the basin so that the person seated on this toilet can actually get to the water and wash their hands in that basin when well, while they're busy in that cubicle so that they don't need to lean over or stretch or find a different uh, point to start cleaning hands. You'll see toilet roll holder and then important 250 maximum so that they can get access to that. And these documents have been around forever. So you'll find this one's got a close couple system. The next one's got a wall lung with a flush master. You'll see that little lever on the flush master for ease of flushing. Here's a concealed system version. And they all basically run on the same principle. You have the same center, you have the same distances. It's all down to the design. So you can play around with the actual uh, flushing or the mode of flushing, whether it be concealed, uh, normal system, or flush master. Given all of them have other uh, lengthened handles or made easier for someone to be able to flush that uh, mechanism without due difficulty. Part T is fire protection. I find most of the time the fire gets done by a specialist. There's no reason why a plumber can't uh, do the same thing, given that all of this would be um, uh, subject of a rational design. In other words, you'll get a drawing and the drawing will tell you that we want this line running from here to there and from there to there. So the guys that are out there that are in the, in the construction industry, you'll find that most of the time these things get done by a specialist. But as far as the water supply up into the actual uh, backflow preventers and all the other valves and applications, that would still be done by the plumber. Part U is refuse disposal. Um, most of us have put gullies in, in refuse areas. It's a, it's a basic requirement. The health department looks at that. So we end up 
doing the drainage to these refuse areas, making sure that when they wash them down or wherever these skips are being collected on site, that there's ways and means of cleaning that, not only the skips, but the area in which the skips are, are, are positioned so that that area and the floors and all of the rest can actually be kept clean. Space eating, we don't get involved with that. So it's part of what the guys do around flues and how the thing gets out of the roof. The only flu we or some of the guys would be worried about would be the one from gas geysers or gas-fired geysers, instantaneous type. Then those flues would have the same requirements as the space eating. So fire installation, this is something we can park on for a couple of minutes. The Regulation contained in part W shall be deemed to satisfy where the fire installations comply with the requirements of 4.2, 3, 4, and 5, which we'll have a look at. And then a supply of water is provided in each division for the effective operation of the number of hose reels, hydrants, and sprinkler heads that are required in accordance with part T and which may be operated or come into operation simultaneously. So part T, the fire thing we just looked at, or the portion around fire that we just mentioned, uh, will, it will indicate exactly what is required, um, how it needs to happen. Uh, 10252 will tell you that there's a, a flow rate of, um, or oh, sorry, a pressure required of 300 kPa per hydrant or per hose reel. And if we can't get that pressure, then obviously we need booster pumping or there's a specialized design required. So having referenced all of the other ones, the fire installation is either the subject of a rational design prepared by a competent person, in other words, an engineer, or a competent person fire in accordance with the principles of the requirements in 10252 part one. So we go back to the water, we go back to the 300 kPa, we go back to 1,200 liters on a hydrant, and we end up getting these things involved, getting those values or those requirements dragged back into the fire design. Or in accordance with the requirements of 4.6, where the area in which the loco located is serviced by a fire brigade contains no sprinklers and serves not more than three hydrants in a division. So if we end up looking at these things here, uh, there's a couple of notes at the bottom as far as the water is concerned. The fire hose reel is an emergency piece of equipment available for use by the occupants of buildings to contain the fire until the fire brigade takes over. Um, I'm yet to see anyone run into a burning building uh, opening a fire hose reel, but the point is that it is not intended to put out the, the or it's, uh, its sole purpose is not to extinguish the whole fire. It is simply there to contain or to try and keep under control until the fire brigade gets there. A fire hydrant is provided for use by the fire brigade to allow the firefighter to get as close as possible to the fire, connect his hose reel, his reel to the fire hydrant and fight the fire. The brigade then will boost the fire hydrant system to the pressure where they needed to, to fight the fire. For the older guys, we used to talk about booster connections. So you'll have a hydrant fitting on the outside, and then you have these boosters and the Dennis pulls up there, and they actually boost that whole supply with water to assist the sprinkler system, to assist the actual uh, water supply inside the building. The local authority cannot guarantee the pressure or supply of water and can only indicate what the residual pressure at a water connection should be. Accordingly, the owner should assess the risk or secure his water supply by means of on-site storage facilities. You do have those tanks or you do have uh, uh, companies at the moment, the big the, the warehouse or the building goes up, they put their own fire supply with pumps, etc., to make sure that they do not have any damage or any unnecessary loss of material or equipment. So under pipe work, in any fire installation, the nominal diameter of a communication pipe serving that installation shall not be less than 75 millimeters. So if it's considered fire supply, it shall not be less than 75 millimeters. And the service pipe supplying water to a hydrant shall not be less than 75 millimeters. A service pipe supplying water to a hosel installation shall not be less than 25 millimeters. So having indicated this in the building regulations, if we go back to 10252 part 
uh, one, you'll find that the 75 millimeter is a given so that any communication pipe shall not be less than 75. And if it gets to 50 meters, it'll be, it'll be upsized to 110 mil. And if it's more, you need to install a ring main. That is, or that is the requirement from 10252 part one so that we don't end up having this huge fire system with not enough water or with not enough of a supply. So you'll see Part T still establishes the requirements for the number of hose reels in fire hydrants and the pressure will be calculated from this formula here and 30 meters, um, 30 meters, you'll see a lot of building plans designed around the 30 meters and the guy draws a circle or the, the architectural professional draws a circle of 30 meters indicating that these things overlap each other. Bearing in mind that 30 meters includes if you're going down a passage, turning right, going down the steps or coming back into another room, we lo we're talking straight line 30 meters. So if you have to go through five or six changes of direction, you, you wouldn't be able to drag that 30 meter hose. Or by the time you've got enough momentum on it, you'll probably pull it off the wall. So this formula, we're not going to worry about the calculation of that formula, but I would just like to go back to SANS 10.252 part one. When it comes to pipe sizing, and you would have noticed part W refers to the same. Pipes in any fire installation or combined installation shall be sized according to a rational design where appropriate. And in any fire installation, the nominal diameter of a communication pipe, in other words, the connection, shall be at least 75 millimeters. A pipe supplying water to a fire hydrant shall be at least 75 millimeters, except where the length of pipe exceeds 50 meters. The nominal diameter of such a pipe shall be at least 100 millimeters. Now, here's a little cheat here for you. Um, a service pipe supplying water to a hose reel on any one story, in other words, one floor inside any building, shall be at least 25 if it serves two hose reels, 32 if it serves three, 40 millimeter if it serves four or five, and 50 millimeter if it serves more than five hose reels. So the the cheat would be if you look at the two, is two, three, 32, three gives you three, four gives you four, five gives you five. So looking at the size of this, take note, it is on one floor of a building. So if you have 10 floors with three hose reels, you'll have 10 floors with a 32 millimeter supplies to that specific story and then the com the the what do you call the the sum of the 32s end up being the main supply going uh, up that riser into the building would be determined by the sum of whatever you have on those different levels that are out there or that is being used um, for that specific purpose so the sizing is still part of uh, our plumbing standards so water supply in buildings you can reference that under 7.8 you'll find that the sizing is there and the same thing would apply the next paragraph is actually the one that refers to the ring main because you need to upsize it to 100 millimeters then as all other alphabetical order things end up, the X would be the last one. So X A being the X being environmental sustainability and X A being energy usage. So uh, two two important things in here for the plumber, and it's something that we're working on. It's something that we're trying to get back to normality. Um, the main thing to remember, and it's a a permanent debate between architectural professional developer plumber and municipality the requirement from the building regulation xa2 is provided the volume of annual hot average hot water heating requirement shall be calculated in accordance with table 2 and table 5 of 10252.1 and if a solar system is used these shall comply with 1307 1106 10254 and 1025 so basically um, when we're talking the amount of water, the calculation, it shall be done according to the water supply. If it is a solar system, shall be done with the solar system, the solar installation standard, Giza installation standard, and the water supply standard. Then the requirements for water installation shall be in accordance with the water installation, the Giza installation, 
all hot water service pipes shall be cleared with insulation minimum R value in accordance with table one. And thermal insulation, if any, shall be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's instruction. So let's not dawdle around. Let's look at table one. Table one says internal diameter of pipe equal or less than 80 millimeters R value one. For the guys that are still complaining, because I uh, hear the merchants and I, I have, we have different training sessions and engagements in industry, we still have guys moaning about the price and having to put lagging. That requirement for our value of one has not changed from 1994. The first ever edition of SANS 025 or SABS 0252 of 1994 had the R value one as a requirement for. Um, lagging pipes 80 or less would have that so have we got any questions we currently do not have any questions okay so so for the guys that are sitting there worrying i am not dyslexic i did not forget about uh part p part p i kept aside for next week um We've basically now, in the last three sessions, we have looked at um, all the boring stuff, all the rest of the document uh, that I said at the beginning we need to be familiar with or not, not necessarily have or not necessarily be able to know of heart. But all the wall, floor, all of the other structural details and elements we've dealt with. So next week, Thursday morning, we can have our ears wide open we're going to have a look at part p which is the only part of our plumbing industry that the bco and the building inspectors and the municipalities are currently governing so for those of you that have sat through the three boring bits sorry about that next week we will definitely have part p drainage um, for the whole session so we can look at all the requirements as per that standard uh, thank you for joining us this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, also, just a reminder that you can find TMP Magazine on the APP Plumber. Thank you very much and have a blessed week.